back and fake. Yep. Um, oh my goodness. I'm losing it. <laughs> Hold on. All right. So, all right. So with our senses, our dog has our their five senses, and so we're gonna go through some different things that will help them in the socialization process. Um, different sights are important. So sites are something that's easy because we're social distancing right now. Um, sites are one thing that we do have full control over um, at a distance. So things like sitting on your front porch with your puppy, rewarding them for being calm and hanging out with you. Um, anytime they look back, you can give them a reward. The reward can be anything from a treat, a piece of food. It can be um, verbal praise, petting, tossing a ball, but kind of fostering that eye contact when they're looking back and checking in, they can check out the thing that's happening, but also looking back at you, um, and that gets the reward. If you're going to the grocery store, you can go as a family, have one or two people sit in the car and watch the people go by. You can roll down your window, kind of park out in the distance, open the back hatch, sit with your puppy in the back hatch, and just reward them for seeing the different sights and sounds, the grocery cart sounds, everything is new to them. The backyard is going to be different from the front yard. Um, going to a golf course right now, since most of those places are shut down, there's not going to be people out there, so that's going to have lots of sites that are new for your puppy as well. Um, sounds are important. We all talk about um, making sure that they're used to baby crying if that's part of the family. Um, there's a soundproof puppy app for your phone that you can get different um, sounds on. You can also get different sounds on YouTube. Um, agility trial sounds is going to be like dogs barking, yelling, clapping, those sorts of things. Um, kids playing sometimes, just dogs barking randomly or cat noises are things that make dogs a little bit nervous at first, but once you accustom them to that, then they get a little more comfortable and you, you see that your puppy is hesitant you can always give them treats or just make the sound a little bit softer. So there's ways that we can make that sound less scary because again, we want them to have a positive experience. Um, if it's garbage day and you want to get up bright and early, um, roll out of bed, take your puppy outside, sitting in the front porch, the garbage truck goes by, it's a new sight, it's a new sound, um, there's people who come out of nowhere and then um, they go away. So it's kind of a quick experience, but something to get your puppy in that socialization component. Um, tastes, you are welcome to try different things with your dogs, some sorts of vegetables dogs like more than others, um, different types of treats. Just make sure that if you're giving any sort of food, if you're switching up their diet, there's always the risk that they might have some GI upset or some softer stools. So just be aware that if that's happening, try and hone down the things that you are offering to them. But that might be something that you might do once a day or every couple of days, um, try and offer them something new. If you're not sure if it's toxic or not, feel free to give us a call at the vet clinic, um, or you can usually Google search and find whether or not something is toxic. But things like lettuce, um, I just gave my dog a little piece of broccoli the other day and she liked it, so you never know what they're going to like. Um, smells. Also part of that socialization, we can't do a lot with smells of other dogs or things like that at this point since we're trying to stay close to home, but things that you might have in your pantry like oregano or rosemary sprinkled very lightly onto a towel or putting a little bit of that on your back deck, um, doing a sniff trail of different things so that your puppy can follow that at their own pace. It's just going to get their brain moving a little bit. Um, Anytime that their brain is processing things, it's taking out some energy, which makes us happier because it means they sleep a little bit more. Um, touch is also one of the things that we can utilize for socialization. So different surfaces, if you've got Amazon shipping things to your house, cut open the cardboard box, put it on the ground. You can even use the packaging material, um, like the big bags full of air that they can kind of push around or meander through, making sure that they're not eating it, of course. Um, Putting out a trash bag or a tarp, um, different surfaces are great for them to investigate. 
Monitor them when they're on different surfaces. Short periods of time when they're on those surfaces is great. If you leave them for longer periods of time, then they're gonna get bored, destroy it, or something terrible might happen. So just kind of keep an eye on them that way. If you have a trailer or a camper or different types of vehicles, having them go out, hopping into and out of the vehicles, um, sniffing around in the vehicles, they can maybe clean up some of it for you. Um, you can use that for socialization as well. Um, remember, having a positive experience is better than no experience at all. Having a negative experience is the worst thing that we can do. If your puppy is showing fear, um, get out of there, give them some space. Distance is always your friend. You can either revisit at a later date or you can skip it altogether and contact a trainer and see where to go from there. Sometimes for puppies, they're in a fear period, which means that things cause more fear than they normally should, and it seems irrational to us. It's just part of their development as they're getting older. So if they're in a fear period, or you say that they're, you open an umbrella and they're terrified, we can choose to just put the umbrella away and revisit it in a couple months once they're older. You could try pairing it with something good. So you take the umbrella out, you lay it on the ground, you offer your dog food and they can investigate at their normal speed. Um, what you want to avoid is pulling them or pushing them closer to the scary thing. Kind of like if you were afraid of spiders and then your friend's like, it's okay, it's just a spider, it's fine. And then you're like, no, thank you. And then that person pushes you closer, you're probably gonna have a worse reaction and a stronger memory later on that spiders are scary. So try and make it a little bit better. If someone fed you ice cream while there was a spider in the room, you might start having some better feelings about it. So food is never going to make your dog more fearful. The only thing it can do is make them have um, better feelings because when we eat food, we get happy. It's the same thing for dogs. Um, dog socialization is something that a lot of people are nervous about right now. If we only have one dog in the household, how is my dog going to interact with other dogs? Um, that is a bridge that we can cross once we get there, but one thing that you can do right now is to encourage appropriate interactions with either a stuffed animal or if you have another dog in the house. Puppies like to greet other dogs at their face, which for adult dogs is very rude. Um, adult dogs, they typically go nose to tail and they circle as they sniff the other dog. Puppies tend to go up to adult dogs and they jump on their head. Um, and most adult dogs don't find that as endearing as we do. It's cute for us, but encouraging them to go up to the rear end of another dog. You can work with this with a stuck animal dog at a distance, depending on the size of your dog, um, finding one that's appropriate in size as well. Um, again, greeting that tail to nose, sort of greeting, circling around. Um, you can even put dog tags on the fake dog to make it sound more like a real dog. Um, just things that will help get the wheels turning a little bit. It also will help you to gain skills if your puppy does, once we get back to real life, um, go and jump on another dog's head. How do I manage that and get that puppy to go nose to tail and circle like a normal dog polite greeting? Um, environmental socialization. So some things that you can do at home right now. Um, if you have kids, have them brainstorm. If you know anyone with kids, they would also love to brainstorm and see things of your puppy um, interacting. It's just gonna make everyone happier. So create a theme. You can do things with wheels. So take a bunch of things with wheels. A vacuum cleaner has wheels. Um, kids' toys oftentimes have wheels. Again, making sure that they're appropriate for your puppy. They're not going to consume them. But having a theme and going from there, seeing what you can grab from the house, having the puppy, um, have that environmental socialization. Puppy walks into the room, you can put treats in the ground so the puppy has good feelings about all the new things in there, just let the puppy investigate. We'll talk a little bit more about body language in a moment, um, but letting them go at their own speed so they're kind of driving that confidence. If they gain confidence by themselves, it's going to be longer lasting than if you were to kind of force them, pick them up, put them right next to it. Um, using rooms in the house to train the puppy that the puppy is not typically allowed in. So putting them on a leash, treating it as if you're going to a friend's house or somewhere else. Um, laundry room, we typically don't have our puppies in, but having them in there, do five minutes of training or just let them sniff around, um, watching that they're supervised if the room is not puppy proofed. Sounds, put the laundry machine on versus off, there's a lot you can do with that. 
um, food smells as well in the pantry? Can your puppy concentrate? Are they happy in there? Um, or are they kind of nervous because it's a new room? Um, bringing weird objects into rooms that they don't typically belong. Ironing boards typically are not in your kitchen. So doing things like that will kind of make puppies stop and think. If there's something weird, a big bulky item in the middle of a room that's not normally there, your puppy might see it. They will have one of two responses. They will either run up to it and be super excited, or they might stop for a moment, look at it, and in that moment they're trying to gain confidence. They're deciding if this is a scary thing or not. We want to avoid doing any sudden movements um, so that our dogs don't become fearful of things. Um, if you've got kids again, or if you're an adult having fun, you can make a blanket fort. And again, that's a big structure um, that your dog can then investigate, and it's something that's safe for them, wanting to prevent it from falling on top of them or anything scary happening, again, fostering good feelings about new objects is what socialization is all about. Um, a couple things that I do with my dogs, um, dressing them up is good to get them used to different things touching them because you never know if they're going to have to have a bandage or something like that. Or if you have kids and they just dress them up, getting them used to that, having it be associated with good feelings. Um, the middle picture is dogs in the car, getting them used to being in the car, even though you're probably not taking them many places, getting them used to being in the car and having good feelings, being calm while they're in there is going to be important. And then if you do go somewhere that you typically don't take your dogs, like if you go to a barn or something like that, um, take your dogs there just for them. Don't have any ulterior motives. Just go for 10, 15 minutes. Take your dogs. You don't have to see anyone. You can just have your dogs experience a new environment that's safe for them. Um, and that will help them learn that those new things are fun and exciting. Um, Kitty pools, as it starts to warm up, are a great socialization event. Um, getting them to dig in the pool, putting ice cubes in there, and all those sorts of things. Just being creative with your puppy is going to help them. Um, if you have normal kid play structures, those are good things to also put some treats on, kind of lure your puppy to get up onto the items, um, new textures, new smells. Um, we talked a little bit about the trash truck pickup, being a loud noise, that's kind of um, abrupt, so that's something that's good for outside. High traffic walking times, keeping your distance from other people, but if you know that you're living around Reeds Lake and there's times where people tend to walk their dogs more often than others, um, have your dogs sit on the front porch as they watch those people go by. Reward your puppy for checking back in with you, working on that eye contact, that self-control is going to be a big deal for little puppies. Um, parks that have streams, bridges, different textures. Um, I have this picture of these deer because if you see deer in your backyard or a certain area, you know that that area is going to be a more high traffic smell area for your puppy. Once those deer are gone or if you scare them away, then you can take your puppy out there, make sure they're not eating anything they shouldn't, but allowing them to sniff around because those deer are going to have different smells that are on the ground if they've been eating grass or rubbing on the trees. Um, just different things, trying to think of what can be outside the norm for our dogs. Um, I use a lot of long lines on my dogs because right now it's hard to take them to fenced in areas. You're wanting to avoid dog parks, especially with puppies, but also um, trying to do the social distancing. A long line is essentially a rope. I usually use somewhere between 25 and 100 foot. If you go into your garage, you can probably find laundry line or something of some sort. And you just hook that to your dog's collar. You can tie a couple knots just to make sure that it's secure. Um, it allows your dog more freedom without having to have that fenced-in security. And they're also not going to be pulling your shoulder out of the socket if they're on just a six-foot leash trying to explore. It just gives them more choice. Um, you'll be surprised at how close your dog tends to stay by you. Um, so when your dog is adventuring off, they might be 10 feet away. When they turn back towards you, giving them a treat or something or just petting them for coming back by you. So you can reinforce your dog being in close proximity because we all want our dogs to have the ability in the end to be off leash and to choose to be by us. So fostering that with a long line gives us the security of having the long line. Um, if they did choose to vacate the premises, but they're um, usually going to choose to be by you. I um, have a couple videos. Um, 
this is a little bit of just long line work. So he's on a 25 foot line. When he gets towards the end, I call him back to me. When he comes all the way back, I give him a little piece of kibble. We're walking in a park here and he's just kind of sniffing at his own pace. There's something he found on the ground. He picks it up, he throws it around for a little bit. I'm not super concerned about, look how happy he is. He loves it. So allowing our dogs to enjoy their environment. Since I didn't make a big deal out of it, he enjoyed it for a moment, then he put it back down. As soon as he looked up towards me, that's when I offered him that piece of food. And I think he'll do it a little bit later on as well. Um, but that's all part of the socialization. If I were to pull everything out of his mouth, that's when our dogs start to consume it because they don't have pockets. And if my dog says, I pick something up and then my person takes it away, they're gonna see me coming and swallow it as fast as they can. So allowing them that um, little bit of choice he chose to pick it up. I didn't make a big deal out of it. He put it down, and when he put it down, that's when I offered him food. I'm doing a little bit of name recognition there. When he gets towards the end, I say his name, he comes back, and I give him food to reinforce that close proximity. There happens to be a volleyball court here, and he gets the zoomies. So this is the different texture, and you might have noticed that your dog, if they walk through some water, all of a sudden they tuck their tail and run. It's a great outlet for him. He has enough space in the long line to do some running around. He ran into the cameraman, but he's having a great time. And it's not that slow walk that we think of doing when we're with our dogs. Um, he's zooming around, he's using all of his muscles um, to take off. I'm asking him to sit, so two seconds of training, and then he gets to go back to being a dog. Does a little bit more running around zoomies, gets back on the grass, and we continue walking. So when we're thinking about training, if you can break it up into tiny increments like that, he's on a new surface, I asked him to sit twice, I gave him rewards for it, he continued to be a puppy. Um, Dublin is five months, I believe, um, so he's not a baby puppy, but he's definitely still got the puppy mentality going. I intentionally brought him over to the trash can area because I figured there'd be lots of smells there. Um, He's more interested in my food, so he's not doing a whole lot of sniffing around, but just thinking where have people been or where have other dogs been? Um, trees, vertical surfaces, there's a little grill um, on the pad behind that I could go to for different smells. Right there, I just toss some food onto the ground so he gets to sniff that food, scavenge for it a little bit, which we'll talk about for a board and buster in a moment. But um, then I know that he can have the outlet of sniffing the ground, but that he's not picking up poop and things that are terrible, that he's actually consuming food that I just put down there. Do one more little video here. Um, this is more um, surfaces, same park, happens to have a bridge. He turned around by himself to look at me. I'm gonna reward that because I like any sort of checking in. He picks up something else, I think the puppy, carries it for a couple steps, puts it down. That one. Yes. So he ran off because there's a runner coming. I said his name, since we've worked on good name response, he responds nicely, comes back to me. And instead of me holding him while he's lunging at the runner, trying to say hi, I just threw a couple treats on the ground. He gets to sniff the ground, but he's still seeing that runner go by. He's still, um, it's on the Let's go. Um, he's still being exposed to that. He's much more confident that second time going across the bridge. Ooh, it turned off. Yes. Um, do a little bit of training there at the end. Sorry. I hate this day and age. Little technical difficulty. <laughs> um. So that's a long line work, that's a 20, 20 foot line, I believe. Um, but anything you find in your house is going to be fine. Oh, shoot. Um, sorry guys. I don't know how to do this. What do you need to do? 
start it from here. We should be able to just go into the view. Yeah. And sorry guys, this is painful. I just want to start from the beginning. Sorry. <coughs> Probably. All right. Um, so places to avoid are going to be um, dog parks because of the potential for disease transmission, um, pet stores, obviously for the people, but also we want to make sure that our puppies are being safe and that they're in safe areas. Sometimes people will bring questionably healthy dogs into pet stores or dog parks. We want to make sure that if our dogs are interacting with other dogs or in dog areas of the dogs that have been there previously are healthy. And we want to avoid them from eating feces outside, either dog or otherwise, um, because of the intestinal parasites and we don't want them to pick up anything. Um, and then observe where you're walking to make sure it's safe for the puppy. We can have the puppies um, in areas where they have different textures, but make sure that their paws aren't going to be small enough to fall through if you're walking them um, near grates or the bridge if you have a very tiny puppy and the puppy's feet can get caught in the bridge areas, um, just making sure that it's safe for them. Uh, as far as body language goes, your dog will tell you if they're comfortable or not because of the body language that, oh, <laughs> because of the body language that they're offering. So in that first picture all the way off to the left, um, that's Crouton, he's standing pretty square. His ears are forward, his tail's pretty neutral. Um, he's pretty confident. When you see your dog start to crouch and his um, head's a bit lowered as well, um, that might be a dog who's a little less confident trying to figure things out. Sniffing the ground is a good thing. So if your dog is approaching something and then all of a sudden they start to sniff the ground, allow them to do that, that's normal. So sniffing the ground can be kind of a time-wasting activity. It's kind of like if you get in an elevator and you pull out your phone to check on Facebook and you don't really care what's on Facebook, but it's just kind of awkward enough to make you a little uncomfortable. Um, sniffing the ground can be the same thing. Um, ultimately, we want our dogs to be pretty neutral, so that small right lower picture of Dublin is pretty neutral. He's hanging out on the bridge. He's not terrified. He's not overly excited. Um, the neutral is what we want to see. Um, meeting people is just as important as the self-control around objects. So while we can't have them meet people or they can't meet all the things, um, Self-control is super important, so that name response, having your dog respond to their name with the distractions around is going to help you out in the long run. Um, rewarding them for checking in with eye contact. Initially, when Dublin was walking across the bridge, he walked a few steps in and then he turned back towards me. That's a behavior that I want to foster, and so I gave him a reward for that. Um, calmly waiting or investigating new objects are also great things to reward. Um, that that self-control component, oftentimes the problems that I get most often as a trainer is my dog can't walk on a loose leash because they're pulling towards everything. This self-control will prevent that pulling because our dog's default behavior will be looking back towards us and checking in um, and investigating from a distance calmly. Um, some boredom busters for our dogs. Hide and seek is great. You can use people. You can have your dog stay in one spot. You can start them in the kennel. Um, it helps by working on a stay, but also helping because they get to run all over the house and try to find you. You can start by making it easy, and then you're going to make it more challenging as it goes. You can even teach your puppy different people's names in the household, which is super handy. Um, my puppies typically know a couple names, so if I have the dogs and they're all around me, but I want to not have them bother me for a moment, I can send them and say, where's... Joey, and then they run and find Joey, and then they're giving me a little bit of space, and they're getting some exercise running across the house. Um, hiding treats, um, having that set up, again, having your dog sit or someone's holding them in place while they watch you put treats around a certain room. You don't want to hide food throughout the entire house, otherwise you get a dog who's looking through the entire house all the time for food, and we don't necessarily need that. Um, Treat scatter, so like I threw some treats on the ground in a smaller area, like a three foot area while I was outside, and kind of burned some time, gives my dog something to do, but it also helps them to use their mind. 
Um, scattering treats outside the front porch on the grass will make it a little bit harder. Um, puppy parkour is also something that you can do. So getting creative with an obstacle course. We don't want them jumping off of stairs or doing a lot of high impact things, but they can certainly go underneath the table and you can use treats to lure them there. Um, going over different surfaces like we talked about, um, the boxes or plastic, anything like that. Hula hoops are awesome to go over, under, or through. Um, since we can't all run out to the craft store to make our own things, um, this towel snuffle mat, kind of like a free puzzle toy, um, I just put a couple, small handful of food on the mat. You just twist it into a spiral, have your dog wait while they watch, and then um, they'll use their nose to kind of push the mat to the side. You can tie it any different way. You can roll it up into a long um, towel. It's however you want to do it, just being creative, giving your puppy's brain five minutes of something to do and giving you five minutes of non-puppy supervision time. I um, want to talk about a couple of typical things for puppies. Um, crate training is something that you might not have in the front of your brain right now, but definitely making sure that your puppy is comfortable in their kennel. We want to make sure that they are comfortable in it for grooming, traveling, hospitalization, post-surgery, but also for your mental sanity. Um, everyone tells you do not use that kennel for punishment. And while we don't want to use it for punishment, it is okay if you've just had enough and the house is chaos and you need a moment, it's okay to put your puppy in the kennel. It's also okay that if your puppy is ripping apart your favorite pair of shoes, that you say no, and then you walk them calmly and say, all right, buddy, get your kennel. As long as that kennel space is happy and you're putting them in there with a happy, upbeat tone of voice, they don't see it as punishment. If you yell at your dog for eating the shoes and then also yell at them and drag them and pull them all the way to the crate, then they're going to see that as punishment and kind of a scary experience. So you can say no and then separate it with a little bit of time and then kennel and it's okay to put them in there. Um, I would encourage you to put them in there when people are home along with when people aren't home just so that they get used to that and that you have that as a resource later on. Um, enjoy your puppy for now, but definitely make sure that you're setting a consistent schedule that you can keep regardless of when we end up all going back to work. So sleep schedule, wake schedule, make sure that you're feeding. Um, and these things are flexible um, to a degree. You don't want to make it flexible every day. Once you end up going back to work, just like when we get kids ready for starting that school year, backing up the bedtime a little bit or waking them up a little bit earlier for the um, few days before so they get back into that routine. It's not just slamming them with the new routine and all of a sudden you're gone for the whole day. Um, potty times, kennel times, all of that is going to be um, fabulous. Um, separation anxiety is definitely something as a trainer that's going to be on my radar for the coming months um, just because our dogs aren't used to having that independence and people are home all the time right now which is wonderful for training um, but we just want to make sure that they are comfortable being away so if you are um, an only individual in your home having your dog do some stays in an area while you pop out of the room go into a different area and come back or throwing a couple treats on the ground, your dog eats them, you pop out of the room, you come back. Our dogs often follow us everywhere, which we find endearing and it's wonderful, but when we go back to work, if our dogs aren't used to being separate or having that independence, um, that can lead us down a bad road later on. Um, puppy biting is a normal thing that dogs do. They do it during play, they do it during excitement. When our puppies get overwhelmed, like when they're doing the zoomies at 9 p.m. at night, um, they will often be a little bit more bitey as well. Uh, it is possible that they're biting for aggression, but it's highly unlikely for little puppies below six months um, to be showing aggression in that component. So typically it's just play. They're happy when they're doing it, and it's an appropriate way for them to play with other dogs. We just had to teach them that biting humans is not appropriate for us, so that we're very sensitive. Um, we want to play appropriate games. So when you're playing with your puppy, if your puppy is biting your hand, that you're ending that play. It seems sad because we want to interact with our dogs, but ending the play for 15 seconds is sometimes enough for our dogs to calm down. Um, 15 seconds doesn't seem like a lot for us, but typically you'll see your puppy look up at you with those big puppy eyes like, oh my goodness, why did the play stop? Once your puppy is calm, then you can get back down on the floor and play with them again. Um, 
when you are playing with them, I would give them three chances. So if after three times you're playing, they bite, you play, they bite, play, they bite, I would give them a time to just play by themselves or time in the kennel if they're running around um, biting everyone. Um, monitoring kids with play, making sure that you're monitoring your puppy's play level. If the puppy is getting super excited and they're doing a lot of jumping, um, usually the biting happens after that. So puppies have different precursors for biting. Oftentimes I see a puppy who will be playing appropriately, then all of a sudden they do this open mouth, kind of waving their open mouth around, and then their teeth happen to touch something, then they happen to chop in a little bit, then that biting gets harder. So if we can go back and say, when a puppy is waving their open mouth around, biting is gonna happen afterward, that's gonna signal to me they need to back down that play excitement a little bit. Um, while you're home alone, um, you can film yourself playing with your puppy if biting is happening a lot and see what happens first. Um, how can you prevent that whole biting sequence from taking place? Um, with chewing, Chewing I would deem as the dog chewing things inappropriately, they're chewing objects. Um, they will do that for investigation because just like babies put everything in their mouth, our dogs do as well. Um, texture is sometimes important for them if they're teething, um, and boredom is the biggest one of why they're chewing. Um, supervision is the number one way to prevent this. Puppy proof in your house, um, appropriate chew toys. If you catch them in the act of being good, they're more likely to be good. So sometimes we look at our dogs and we're like, oh, thank goodness, they're chewing on that appropriate dog toy. I'm gonna run and brush my teeth real quick and then I'll come back. And we just ignore them. And then our dogs say, oh, well, this is fun, but kind of boring. If I chew on the grandfather clock, the people all rush over really fast. So they learn that that's a way to gain um, attention from people. So make sure that if they're doing something right, that you're telling them, wow, good dog, you're chewing on your appropriate toy. Pet them um, and then go on. It doesn't have to be a long thing. It can be three seconds of saying, wow, good dog, and then move on with life. Your dog's gonna look at you initially um, and maybe get up, but typically they start to accept that, oh, chewing on this appropriate toy gets me appropriate attention. Um, there are chew deterrents out there like bitter apple um, or fooey. Some people will make a vinegar mixture for things that our dogs tend to go back to. Um, so if they're constantly chewing on the backboard, spraying some of the vinegar type chew deterrent mixture on that area can sometimes prevent them for the next 30 minutes or so from going immediately back. But usually just moving them to a different area of the house that's not by those things that they're typically chewing is going to be our best bet. Um, you can also leave a leash on your dog in the house and that can help with supervision as well. Digging, since kind of the name of the game right now is boredom, um, digging is something that can often happen with boredom. Sometimes they do it if it's a hot day to cool down, sometimes they hear critters underneath the ground, sometimes they're just looking for food or things they think are food, um, but oftentimes it's just boredom. So when we throw our dogs outside in the backyard, we want them to run around like crazy and get the energy out, but they want to be by us, and if they're not right by us, typically they find their own games, which might include um, digging up things, flowers, just holes randomly. Um, so if you do throw it out in the backyard, you can do a treat scatter so that they're doing an appropriate sniffing and scavenging behavior, just tossing a handful of treats out there. Um, using supervision, playing with them outside, so giving them some toys, um, or running around having the dog follow you, um, getting some exercise while they're out there can prevent that digging as well. Um, potty training, we'll spend a couple slides on this. Consistency is the name of the game going at the same door to the same spot in the yard, saying the same cues, so the entire family being on the same um, page. When the puppy begins to go to the bathroom, I recommend praising softly. If you praise too excitedly, as soon as they start going to the bathroom, they're like, oh, my person's really happy, and then they stand up. They've only peed half of their bladder, they come back inside, it gets boring again, then they empty the rest of their bladder. So praise softly initially, when they're standing up to finish, then you can praise lavishly. And then I recommend spending a few seconds to a couple minutes outside letting that puppy play and sniff around. Some puppies learn that as soon as they go to the bathroom, they get pulled back inside and it's kind of boring. So that puppy might learn to not go to the bathroom as quickly because they want to stay outside and they do all their sniffing first until they absolutely have to go. Um, so spending a couple minutes outside or a couple seconds after they go to the bathroom and that'll be kind of the reward sequence that they go through. Lots of different times that we can take them outside. 
um, eating, drinking, 20 minutes after drinking, especially if they drink a lot, um, after a nap, hard play, when they come out of the kennel in the morning, but then also if you put them in there just for like a downtime, um, when they come out of the kennel, usually they've got a full bladder and they have to go out and hide again. Um, if they start sniffing the carpet, um, that is one time to bring them outside if they start circling. And some of our dogs have weird cues, like they might just walk up to you and stare at you for three seconds and you're like, oh, you're kind of cute, and they pee on the ground. If that sort of sequence is happening, when your puppy stares at you for three seconds, take them outside. So all the dogs are a little bit different in how they tell us. Dogs don't typically reliably start to signal until they're closer to five months of age. So up until that five months, if your puppy is not having accidents, that means that you get an A plus for keeping them on a great schedule and giving them lots of opportunities to go outside. Um, if your puppy is beyond that six months, they're probably going to start giving you signals um, a little bit more reliably. They will at some point lapse in their training. They're going to go through fear period um, where some things that weren't scary before are now scary, but they also lapse in their obedience and their potty training. So it is very normal for them to um, be doing really well and then all of a sudden you have two weeks of mega accidents, but then stand by because it gets much better after that. Just get them back on that same schedule. So if you're having accidents, treat them like they're eight weeks old again, they'll get much better. It's just part of that normal development. Nothing that we can do to prevent it. I'm just going to push forward from there. Um, supervision, again, watching for those cues. Watch for wandering off. Um, our dogs don't go to the bathroom behind the couch or in a different room because they are being resentful or anything like that. They just know that some places in the house are safer to go to the bathroom than others. They know that if they go to the bathroom in a room that nobody's in, nobody yells at them. But if they go to the bathroom in front of you, usually we get kind of upset. So if your dog does have an accident and you catch them in the act, you can grab them real quick, put them outside. Um, when they go to the bathroom and finish, then you say, wow, what a good dog. And you praise them as if it didn't happen, go inside and clean it up. If you not catch them in the act, it's too late. If the puppy has already left the room or they're five steps away from the accident, they don't realize that the act of going to the bathroom is what you're upset with. They just know that if there is some sort of accident on the ground and there's a human there, it's not safe. And so that's when they start to kind of wander elsewhere. Um, so consider setting a timer if that keeps happening um, or a reminder on your phone. Life is kind of chaotic right now. So just making sure that you're getting your dog on a good schedule. Or you can use the kennel. If you don't have time to supervise them, put them in their kennel. They'll just take a nap or you can give them like a calm toy or something like that. Um, as far as training goes, I want to mention two of my favorite training things. One is name response. So in that video with Dublin, you saw that he had a pretty strong name response. A runner was coming, I said his name once, and he came right back. Having that fast response can be life-saving if your dog does manage to get off leash and they start running away. I recommend practicing their name response 100 times a day, and that can be with food. It can also be with praise, petting, um, anytime you go outside. If you're going to take your dog out to potty anyways, say their name first, they look at you, wow, what a good dog. Now we get to go outside. So using those lifestyle rewards, you're gonna do it anyways, why not put their name response in front of it? You're gonna start by saying their name and giving a treat just to pair that really strongly. And then eventually you'll say their name, wait for the response, then give the treat as they start to catch on. We want to have enough good name responses that are rewarded in the bank because eventually there will be a time where you have to use your dog's name and it's gonna be sad because we're gonna be upset and it happens. But I want so much good in the bank of their name response that even when I use their name and I'm sad about it, um, that they still respond and that we can push forward and they continue responding even after I make a mistake. Um, you can use it for a recall, so again, calling them back to you if they get off leash. If you are walking past a dead skunk or something like that on the side of the road, you can say their name. If they're looking at you, they're going to be less apt to look at that thing that you don't want them to pick up. It's also great for focus um, and it makes supervision easier because if your dog runs to you as soon as you say their name, you can kind of look around. If you don't see the dog in your room, call them to you. They come right over. You can reward them, toss a toy, do something um, that you were probably going to do anyways. Um, settling on a mat is also an important thing that I have my puppies do. Um, so this is Disney in the house guest Milton hanging out on a bed. I choose a spot that I want my dog to settle on, and then I make that area the best area of the house. So placing treats on that bed when they're not looking 
If you have kids, have them be sneaky about it. If the dog's not in the room, put two pieces of food on there. Your dog's gonna come smell it, they'll venture back over and get rewarded for going to the bed all by themselves. Um, if they are checking back and finding those treats all by themselves, then they're not gonna necessarily pair you with the goodness, they'll pair the bed with the goodness, which is what we want. I want my dog to be able to station on an area. When I come home from work and I'm exhausted, I can put the bed out, my dogs hang out on the bed, I can eat dinner and not have dogs jumping all over me. And then once my mental sanity is back, then I can start um, interacting with my dogs and doing those sorts of things. But then it allows me to have kind of a kennel outside of the kennel. Since you might be using a lot of pieces of food for this, or if the kids are helping you, they might be pretty excited about putting the food out all the time, just use their normal ration. So you can feed breakfast and then put lunch or dinner on the counter, um, somewhere the puppy can't reach, but where the kids can still grab at it, they can just feed whatever is in there. And if at the next meal there's no food in there, we still know that they got all of their calorie contents for the day, um, and they're not just eating um, things that might get them GI upset, like those softer treats. Um, or anything that's too rich. Exercise is a good thing, but your puppy should be pleasantly tired and not exhausted. Um, I have it here to consider whether you want your dog to be a bodybuilder. So if we keep building them up to, um, I'm going to run my puppy for two miles, now they're exhausted, and I'm going to run them for three miles, and they're exhausted, that puppy is going to eventually build a tolerance, and they're going to need that amount of exercise long term. The exercise that you're doing right now should be sustainable for when you go back to work as well. So we want them pleasantly tired. Um, avoid running long distances on hard surfaces in a straight line, um, especially for our little puppies, but puppies' growth plates don't close until 18 months, so their bones are still growing. If we have a lot of hard surfaces and repetitive motions, if you're taking your dog on a run on the road, they're doing that straight line movement, and that's gonna be a little bit harder on their joints. Take lots of breaks. Um, if your puppy plops down as soon as you stop, you've done too much. If you're, again, walking that puppy in a straight line, you've walked them for four miles, you started running them. Um, if your puppy stops when you stop um, and lays down too much, your puppy is going to continue walking when you start walking because they want to be with you. So don't use that as the um, kind of measure of whether or not your dog is exhausted. If you're moving away, your puppy is certainly going to come with you. If you're working on a long line, and your puppy has time to do some zoomies and then they walk and they sniff and then they try a little bit and go back to walking and sniffing, that's that puppy taking their own breaks and usually you can spend a little bit more time doing that. They're gonna be more exhausted because they're making more choices um, on the long line. So that's why I love it so much. Um, remember, your puppy is just a puppy. Be patient and enjoy the, pup the puppy journey. Um, this is Crouton sitting on top of a human. He's just a puppy, he's goofy. Um, they're not perfect. There's nothing that we can do to make them perfect. So just enjoy that time um, right now. All right, so I'm going to change this. All right. Um, we can do it. We can? Yes. Okay, perfect. Any questions that anyone has about their puppy, anything individual, anything that you're nervous about for the future, anything um, boredom-wise? Kongs are a good toy. I didn't throw that in there, but if you have um, like a Kong food puzzle toy, um, I like putting things in there that are part of their normal diet. So if you put kibble in there, put like a little bit of peanut butter on one end or cream cheese, um, to close the hole, put some kibble in there, fill it with water, and then freeze it. That's gonna be a longer activity and it's not gonna add a whole lot of um, calories to their diet that might upset their GI tract. Um, any other favorite boredom busters that you guys have that you want to share? You're welcome to raise your hand and I will unmute you if you have a longer thing than you care to type. Um, parks, oh, yeah, that's the amount of food. Um, yeah, so thoughts on the amount of food for puppies. Um, typically, you can go by what the bag says. Sometimes the bag will have you feed a little bit more than what your puppy needs um, because it would be terrible PR if your puppy starved to death on their food. 
but typically the bag is about right. We want to make sure that our puppies are um, not looking like little circles. They should have a little bit of a waistline, um, and there's lots of pictures online of good body condition scores is what they call it in um, veterinary medicine. Um, puppies typically have a pretty good food drive, um, especially the large breed ones, so it's not abnormal for them to always be hungry. If your puppy is eating too fast, you can feed in a muffin tin, um, so spreading that food out or on a um, cookie sheet to slow them down a little bit. Um, my concern about dogs eating too fast is if they vomit. If your dog is eating quickly but not vomiting, usually they're pretty fine. Um, so I would, I guess, feed whatever is on the bag for the food. Um, walking on the leash. Puppy loves to walk with us off leash, but as soon as we put the leash on, she doesn't want to walk, especially away from the house. Um, you could try using a very lightweight long line. So if you have something um, like a laundry line or something that's lighter weight, put that on, just let your puppy drag it around. When your puppy is in the house, I would put that um, five foot leash on your puppy, just attached to the collar and let them wander around as well without touching the end of it. Getting used to that weight of the leash um, is typically something that our puppies need as part of the learning curve. So letting them just drag that around the house is going to help them get used to that clip being on there. Um, small breed dogs especially, the weight of that metal clip can sometimes affect how they behave. I feel like something's coming. Um, oh, sometimes one more um, off leash, on leash thing. Sometimes the flexi leads, the pressure of that pulling back into the leash can prevent our dogs from wanting to walk as well. So if you are using a flexi lead as a long line, um, I'd recommend locking it all the way out so that there's not that con constant tension on it. Um, so I'm walking the dog. Not to make a big deal when the puppy is picking items up, but the puppy likes to pick up everything, even trash. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so part of that is going to be setting up your environment. If you can be super observant about what you're walking into, oftentimes you don't see it. It looks like a leaf and then it ends up being a piece of paper, or we just don't see it because we're at a different angle and our puppies are right there on the ground. Um, I will oftentimes have food on me when I'm walking. If my puppy picks something up, I might make a little treat trail away from it. They're gonna see the food. Typically they want to eat the food and as they eat the food, they're walking away from that piece of trash and they typically drop it by themselves. My um, mindset is if it's not going to kill them, I care less about it. Um, so if it's something like they pick up ibuprofen or something, or a cigarette, but I might take that out of their mouth. But typically if it's something that is organic, like leaves or sticks, um, I just keep on walking. Sometimes you can pick up your pace a little bit, and if you start walking faster and your dog starts trotting, they will typically drop it out of their mouth too. Um, are bully sticks safe for puppies? And how do you feel about um, the pen to keep them safe? So bully sticks, um, and rawhides are something that they do have calorie content, so making sure that they're not causing any GI upset. I would definitely supervise your puppy with any sort of semi-edible treat to make sure that they're not taking off larger chunks than they need to. Um, and then spacing them out will help them to kind of spend time chewing them and then that they can watch something else interactive fetch or something like that. Um, but definitely it's something that you can use rawhide and things like that, supervise in the evenings when you want to just kind of calm down with your puppy. Um, puppy pens, like X pens, um, exercise pens are a little bit bigger, like a play pen for a child, but it's metal for a dog. Um, I do like those. Sometimes I've seen people put um, an exercise pen and then put the kennel inside of that. Um, and the pen can give them a little bit more freedom. It can also help if you're working outside, but you don't want your puppy to be digging in, into everything. Um, having that pen be a smaller area that you can just put toys in so your puppy's not ripping up 
all of your landscaping. Um, I think that's a safe place for them. Um, should I put him oh, on a harness while on the long line? Yeah, it's definitely not going to hurt to put them on a, like a harness while they're on a long line, um, just in case they do hit the end of it. If you have been working up with your name response and calling them when they're halfway out, call them back to you, give them a treat, they're typically not going to slam into the end of that. Um, but I do definitely use caution if your puppy is getting towards the end. Um, and kind of you can make the kissy noises or um, clap your hands to see if you can get them back um, so that they're not hitting the end of that long line. Sometimes they can get up a lot of speed, especially our larger breed dogs. You guys have good questions. I like it. My question about food. Puppy is 11 weeks old today and I currently feed her once in the morning, lunch and dinner. Um, So 11 weeks old, I would stick with the three times a day. If your puppy is currently on three times a day, I would stick with that. If um, you've already switched them over to twice a day, um, that's fine, especially for larger breed dogs. Typically we'll keep them on three times a day until they're between 12 weeks to five months. Um, our very small breed dogs have a very small stomach, so they need to eat more often to keep their glucose up than a larger breed dog like a lab can usually go um, two times a day. I've seen it at even eight weeks. Um, usually the breeder will let you know what they fed. Um, it all comes down to the weight of the dog. So that's why I recommend feeding what's on the bag and the weight range. Um, if your puppy is stooling a lot, um, then I would uh, potentially consider switching foods. Sometimes dogs will have better tolerance to some foods than others. Um, some puppies need a high quality food. Some puppies, if you feed them a high quality food, they actually have um, loose stools and it doesn't sit well with them. So it's finding what food is best for them um, as an individual. Um, what foods do I recommend for puppies? Um, Hill, uh, science diet, Ro Science diet, I'm looking at my um, helper. Um, science diet is a good one. Ro Canin, um, Purina Pro Plan. Purina Pro Plan. Um, do we have recommendations on our website? I don't know if we do at the moment. I'll throw some, um, let me make a note and then I will um, throw out, I'll send an email afterwards. Um, Food recommendations. Um, I do recommend staying away from grain-free foods. Um, they've been doing some studies on that, grain-free diets and heart conditions. So um, I try to stay away from that if at all possible. Um, ooh, question about treats. So when we start training in the last my place here. Um, so the question was, how do we recommend taking the dog off of treats when they're expecting them all the time? Um, they're looking at hands to see if you have treats before listening. Our puppies are very smart. So um, trying to make it as kind of, I'm gonna make another note. I'll send you an article on this too. Um, trying to make it as nonchalant as possible. We, just like we talked about for dogs biting and the predictors that they have um, before they get super excited and start grabbing at their hands, um, we have a lot of predictors for when we are going to train. So when I put my training hat on, I get my treat bag, I put my treats in my pockets, or I go over and I grab a scoop full of food out of the bin, um, and my puppy says, oh, now is the time when I get the rewards. And there's times when I ask for those same commands, and I don't have those precursors, and now is the time where our dogs start to say, well, if there's nothing in it for me, I'm not going to try. Um, changing it up so that you don't have those precursors, just starting off the morning, 
put a few treats in your pocket. That way, when you have your dog and they're looking at you, you can ask for that sit. If your dog doesn't sit, no big deal. But if they do choose to sit, wow, what a good dog. And I magically pull food out of my pocket. They didn't know it was there. They didn't see me gather it. And it was outside of that training session. Um, I'll throw out an article um, via email on how to kind of wean off of those treats. Um, I wouldn't be in a huge hurry to wean off of treats in general at this point because they're still very much babies in their brain and we have a lot of teaching to do. Um, but definitely if you're seeing that puppy who looks at you, you say sit and then they ponder, do you have treats or not? That's when I would start doing a little bit more of that carrying food on you so that when they do have that fast response, you do have the opportunity to give them food and reward them for that um, so that we don't end up with a beautiful response and not having anything on us. But you can always use things that are non-food as well, like throwing a toy or um, even just being goofy. If you're outside and you don't have any sort of reinforcement on you, your dog does something absolutely fabulous. You can talk in a high-pitched voice, get on your knees, and start just being goofy on the ground. Your dog's going to love that. And they're going to go wild. Um, it's going to be even better than a food reward. So consider the non-food items as well um, as part of those reinforcers. Um, 16 weeks old puppy does not like his kennel. Screams, put treats inside at, at different times, which is perfect. Um, Definitely recommend making it a happy place like that. Um, cries dramatically for five minutes at night, um, but consistently during the day. Um, so some things that can make the crate a happy place are randomly putting treats inside, um, even when they're not right there so they can go over and investigate on their own. Putting a light sheet or a blanket over the top of the kennel can help as well, just make it a little bit more um, dark in there. Putting a box fan or a radio next to it can help drown out some noise, especially with families being home right now. Sometimes their puppy is sleeping, we we'll wake them up, or we put them in the kennel and then they perceive that fun things are happening elsewhere in the house and they just want to be involved. So then they start barking, and if we respond to those barks, then they're going to say, oh, well, that worked. It's kind of like a light switch. I bark, the person comes over, and I do or do not get let out. Either way, a person coming over is a reward. So trying to ignore them if possible. Giving them some sort of longer lasting, like a Kong toy or something when they're in there can help putting them in for short increments at a time. So you put the puppy in, they have a Kong toy, um, they chew it for five, 10 minutes, then you let them out before they're done eating it, then that can help also. Um, usually it's just a time will fix it eventually. If it's really frustrating, I recommend charting it out and you can set a timer for when that puppy starts crying and then when they end crying because it typically is getting better from night to night, but it's a long process. So sometimes that process is slow, but sometimes having actual numbers of, oh, today it was 10 minutes, um, the next day it's eight minutes, the next day it's seven minutes, that we can see that progress. It helps give us a little bit more of reinforcement as the humans to know that it is getting better and that it will eventually subside, um, but typically just time will help that. Um, puppy sleeps in the kennel at night next to the bed. Um, puppy is starting to get up earlier and earlier. Um, should we take him out one more time and put him back in the kennel, even if he seems, even though he seems awake? It's definitely fine to take your puppy outside for a potty break and then put them back in the kennel. Um, if your puppy is waking up earlier and earlier, typically it's because they find something exciting happening in the morning. If you let them out of the kennel, potty, and then feed them, that puppy is probably going to get up a little bit earlier as well because they think maybe if I get up earlier, then I get to eat earlier, which for some of our labs in large breed dogs, that's a high reinforcer. Um, having them get up in the middle of the night, I typically make it as business-like as I possibly can. So that means I'm not playing with them. I'm not doing a whole lot in the reinforcement category. Um, if puppy wakes up in the middle of the night, I take them outside. Typically, I carry them so they don't have an accident on the way out. Um, I put them outside. As soon as they go to the bathroom, I say, oh, what a good dog. I don't do any food or any other reinforcement. I take them and I put them back into their kennel. Um, so it's not a time for play. It's not a time for us to sniff. Um, not a time for eating or drinking water. Um, it's just very business-like. And then 
I don't want to be up any extra time in the middle of the night, and I'm sure you don't either. Um, so I would do that same protocol in the early morning as well. You can start to chance it by pushing it out. If you set a timer and you want him to wake up at 7.30, but right now he's waking up at 5.30, if you wake your dog up at 5.30 and the next day, 5.45, 6 o'clock, you can push it out systematically like that, um, and that can help them be successful in pushing out that time. Um, again, setting that schedule that's going to be consistent now, but also being able to modify that later on um, might be a, situ a scenario that we're in. Yeah, the kennel is definitely a very versatile place that you can use. Um, kennel, X-Pen as well, the playpen for dogs. Um, to allow them that time to learn how to settle in. It is a skill set for our puppies to learn how to be settled and how to have that alone time. Um, they come out of a litter and they have all their friends and their mom and all that craziness all the time, lots of opportunities to play. And so we had to teach them how to come down from that excitement, um, how to settle in and kind of how to have naps and throwing those into the day. You guys are awesome. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, talk about puppy things. I'll send out an email um, in the next 48 hours with a couple exercises on the name response. Um, I'll send one out on starting off that settle on a mat. Um, Weaning off treats, I'll throw in there, but just be cautious um, because we have lots of puppy learning and kind of riding the puppy roller coaster, um, but that'll give you an idea of where to go from there. Um, and then food recommendations as well. Um, love on your puppies, enjoy them. They're not perfect. They might never be perfect, but they will be fun and a wonderful addition to your family. Um, so enjoy the time that you have with them right now. Lots of patience. Um, and they're gonna do great things in the end. Have a wonderful afternoon. And then give them the meeting. I'll wait for them to, oh, okay. if anyone has any last minute.